What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate, and you're listening to See It to Be It. Now, I'm thankful for See It to Be It because, again, it represents the fact that Living Corporate is a network. We have various types of content going on, um, not only on the Living Corporate podcast, our flagship podcast, where we have Real Talk Tuesdays, the Tap In with Tristan on Thursdays, and See It to Be It with Amy C. Weininger on Saturdays, but we also have The Leadership Range hosted by Neil Edwards that comes out every Monday. And then we also have uh, the group chat that comes out every other Saturday, hosted by Nubiana Oppen. And we have the Access Point, which is hosted by Tristan Layfield, Mike Yates, Brandon Gordon, and Tiffany Tate, hosted every single Tuesday. Right? And we have a new show coming out that I'm not even going to talk about yet, but it's coming. It's coming. I'm just happy and I'm thankful that we're here. And I'm thankful to Amy. Amy, what's going on? How you doing? How are you? Hey, I'm excited because I'm actually going to be on um, one of the webinars in February. That's right. You're, you're going to be on one of the web shows. Uh, yeah, the one so let's about, plug that real quick. Yes, you're going to be on um, when I found out that I'm an Amy Cooper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm going to be on. <laughs> exploring, <laughs> explore, exploring the role of white women uh, in uh, upholding and reinforcing white supremacy and how they can and how they can actively dismantle it instead in corporate contexts. And I'm excited about it because I'm going to be, um, it's going to be the first time I'm sharing the spotlight with um, Karen Fleshman, who is a friend of mine and somebody that I've admired for a long time. And, um, but we've never actually worked together. So this is going to be like the start of the first thing that we actually do together. I love Karen because when I talk to her, I can tell like there's a very, she has so much intentionality in like, saying and doing the right things right like she doesn't come across with like this smug arrogance that like oh i'm an ally oh i'm oh i'm anti-racist like that's just not her vibe like she comes across with a very like just intentional aura of like wanting to do what's right seeking to dismantle what she can and speaking truth to power where she can i just i find that very refreshing and she put she puts her body on the line for it yeah I mean, she's, you know, she's been arrested a few times, you know, protesting white supremacy. It's really incredible to watch. And it's, it's, you know, I just, I feel honored um, that I can call her a friend. I mean, she's, she's great. Now, um, you know, we're doing, so look, this is not my show, Amy. I, I come on here to put my face out there so people know that this isn't, you know, colonization. Because that's really something you wanted me to do. So I'm here really as a, as a favor to you, you know, out of love for you. But this is not my show. This is your show. So let's talk about like for this, for people who maybe this might be like the first time that they've heard of See It To Be and maybe the first time tuning in. What is See It To Be? Yeah. So I want to be clear. It's not my show either. This show is all about the guests and it's all about their career journeys and how they got to be in these jobs that some of us have maybe never even heard of before or don't even know exist. And the idea here, you know, the idea that I had when you came to me and you said, we need, you know, we want some more content from you, Amy. I was like, I don't know what to do. Um, But I was thinking, you know, I grew up in a place where when people went to college, they didn't come back. Right. I grew up in very rural Midwest, very white, very blue collar. And if people got to college, like we never saw them again. And so I didn't know a lot of the jobs that were out there. And I went to college not having any clue. And, you know, my first degree didn't get me anywhere. So I went back for a second one. And oddly enough, and I don't know if you know this, Zach, but um, I married somebody that that I went to high school with. Uh, Not my first marriage. My second marriage was my high school sweetheart. And um, he's the youngest of four. We all five graduated from the same high school. Um, We all five have two bachelor's degrees each because we went to college not knowing what to do with college. So, you know, I'm just kind of channeling channeling that experience and that being sheltered from from the world of work right from being sheltered from careers and professional environments and thinking about you know how do young people who maybe don't have people in their family who've been to college or maybe their neighbors haven't been to college or you know the the folks around them right you know where do we go if we don't know these things exist how do we possibly aspire uh to get those jobs or to to break into those sectors of the economy And so what I really want to highlight in this show is the stories of the people who are doing the work and how they got into it, because sometimes it's a straight path. And sometimes it's like, you know what? I woke up one day, I didn't have a job. And somebody said, hey, come work with me. And that's how I got in this line of work. And I think those stories are so important for all of us to hear, but especially for young people 
who are trying to figure out, look, I've got these five skills and this is my passion and I don't know what to go do with it. You know, you missed the part, the fact that all the professionals you highlight are black and brown, black and disabled, black and brown and female, black and brown and trans or queer, right? Like talk about that. Yes. So yeah, this, well, obviously since I'm on, <laughs> you know, on your platform and I know that, you know, living corporate highlights the experiences of black and brown folks in corporate America or in the workplace. I wanted to make sure that, that this show, you know, was in that same spirit. And so I go, you know, I go all over and I talk to people in all different parts of the economy, but yeah, they're all black or brown and they're all, you know, in some way contributing to this narrative that role models can look a lot of different ways. They can show up a lot of different ways. And, you know, my guest today actually is um, not just brown, but brown and disabled. Hitesh lives in Singapore now. He splits his time between Singapore and India. Um, But when he was born, he had um, some medical complications and he actually has cerebral palsy. And so the work that he's doing is not just, you know, in uplifting people in his community, but specifically uplifting people all over the world who share, you know, that particular, you know, medical condition and helping them see themselves as, you know, what they can be, but also helping their families see the potential in these folks and what they can accomplish. Because I think a lot of times, even parents will say, well, you know, we've had to adjust our expectations of what our child can accomplish. And what I loved about Hitesh's story was his parents did not adjust their expectations of what he was going to accomplish. And it, it really, you know, he's out here, he is changing the world for people. That is incredible. Well, I can't wait to hear the conversation. I'm excited for our audience to learn about this person's journey. Before we do that, though, let's go ahead and tap in with Tristan. What's going on, y'all? It's Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting, and I've teamed up with Living Corporate to bring you all a weekly career tip. Today, we're going to dive into a goal-setting method that will help you achieve your goals through actionable steps. There are many goal-setting methods out there, and you really have to find the one that works for you. One that I use and actually uncovered from someone I follow on Twitter is called Boulder Rock Sand. It takes smart goals to a whole nother level. Boulders are your overarching high level goals or statements. So for example, a boulder statement would be, I want to become a project manager in 2019. Rocks are your smart goals that once you achieve them, accomplish your boulder. For those who don't know, smart goals are goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. An example of a rock statement is, I will take on two projects and complete my PMP certification by December 31st, 2019. Typically, you want to have three to five rock statements for each boulder you set. It is imperative that these be as specific as possible and actually achievable. So if you set a goal of having your PMP certification by February of 2019 and it's December of 2018, you will more than likely fail because of the need to take the course and gather a certain amount of project hours, not to mention actually taking and passing the test. Now, the SAND statements are the specific actions you will take in order to achieve your rock statements. So for example, I will one, have a discussion with my boss about projects I can join, two, utilize my in-office connections to identify projects in need of assistance, and three, identify and register for a PMP certification course. You can then put these actions into a card on a Trello board where you have four columns, not started, in progress, blocked, and completed. Each card has a goal deadline date and begins in the not started column. Once you begin working on it, you move it to the in progress column. Now, the block section is for when life happens and sort of stops your progress on that goal. So if your job requires you to travel for a lengthy, unexpected period of time, the card is moved to blocked until you're back and able to return to working on that task. Setting up goals in a Trello board in this fashion allows you to visually see your progress, which provides motivation to keep going and achieve your goals. This tip was brought to you by Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume, or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining me. I'll be talking to you soon. Hitesh, welcome to See It To Be It. I'm so glad to have you here. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Thank you for inviting me to the show. 
So you are right now in Singapore, and I understand that you split your time between Singapore and India, right? Correct. That's absolutely right. So tell me a little bit about your journey, because you started out with not great odds. I watched your the story <laughs> of Hitesh video, and you know when you were born, they didn't give you very good odds of survival, even the tw- first 24 hours. Can you tell us a little bit about... Um, you know, how you came to be here with us and, and doing the amazing work you're doing. So, so, I mean, let me, let me give you a quick introduction about myself. So I'm a Daesh, I'm a global motivational speaker. What's so special about me is that I'm born with a disability called cerebral palsy. Now, many of you may be wondering, what is cerebral palsy or how did I get it? Cerebral palsy is a neurological disorder. It can affect you physically or mentally, but I'm not mentally affected, only the physical, the walking and the speech and the coordination part. How did I get it? (laughs) When my mother was giving birth to me, I was a breech baby. I was upside down in my mother's tummy. And the doctors were told to do a C-section, means cut the stomach and take the baby out. But they didn't follow the orders. They did the normal delivery. So usually when a baby is born, the head comes out first. For me, I was born the other way around. My leg came out first and my head got stuck in my mother's womb for 90 seconds. So during birth, I lost oxygen for 90 seconds, which led to a brain damage. Now when people meet me for the first time, they always ask, bro, are you drunk? I said, nah, I'm all good, but I think my doctor was drunk. <laughs> and oh the, day I was, the day I was born, the doctor told my parents, I'm going to die within 24 hours. 28 years have gone by. I'm alive, but I think the doctor died. <laughs> wow. So just having gone through three pregnancies and deliveries and two of those being C-sections. It, it, your story brings up a lot for me and what your mother must have been going through um, and you know what that must have been like for your, for your family. Um, but I'm so glad that your doctor was, I'm sorry that your doctor was wrong in the first place, but I'm glad that they were wrong about your uh, chance of survival because you are out here just making a huge difference in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. So how did you, what started first? Were you the athlete first or the inspirational speaker first? It happened coincidentally in a similar period of my life. So before I go to my success, let me go to my childhood because that's where the struggle was. Now, in my childhood, I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk. I was told that I may have to use a wheelchair my entire life. But I was blessed to be born in a good family. My parents believed in me. They knew that the universe gave them such a child for a bigger purpose. They brought me up like a normal kid with a positive mindset. They told me, look, son, you can do everything like everyone else. You're no different. Don't ever look down at yourself. So I was brought up with that grit mindset and the education system suggested that I should go to a special school. But my parents wanted me to live a normal life and they fought the system and made sure I went to a normal school. Now, when I went to a normal school at the age of six, I would get bullied, teased. And obviously, 
academic wise i was slower due to my physical limitation as i grew older i became more aware and conscious about my disability and that's why my confidence broke because people started judging me society stereotype me and you know when you're a teenager all the girls and guys get attracted to each other but unfortunately in my case all the girls would run away from me but too bad the girls did not know that one day i'll be a global speaker playing for the paralympic football team working with celebrities around the world that's why i tell all the ladies please think twice before you reject a guy you don't know he may become the next bread pit right that's right <laughs> that's the struggle part <laughs> now coming to your question so at the age of 20 i would play football for fun but then you know when i played with the normal guys i didn't get much play time because my brother vicky he was the captain of the team and he would only let me play for 10 minutes in a 90 minute game so i'm like what's wrong with you am i that bad he said no you're not bad i'm just scared you get injured because the guys down here the players know we are playing a world cup tournament <laughs> right so i'm just scared they injure you and all that so i'm just cautious as the old brother and he randomly said why don't you try to play for the paralympic football team and like what does singapore have a paralympic football team he said if they have a normal team they'll have a paralympic football team right and he didn't know anything he was just working his usual dialogues just to cheer me up but that day i went to my google then i found a paralympic football team i went for the trials i got selected and i never went back to his team <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> So the people that you play with on the team, are they, so I don't know a whole lot about how the Paralympics works. Are you, are you grouped by, by your abilities? Are you, or is it sort of a cross section of, you know, people with varying abilities and, and different disabilities? So in the Paralympic football team for Singapore in Asia, there's two types for football. Number one is blind football. The number two is cerebral palsy football. So in the cerebral palsy football team, all the guys are affected. They all have cerebral palsy. Okay. <laughs> and so the then way, the other teams the way, that you play, are you matched according to, so you're playing other teams whose players have uh, cerebral palsy or are you playing teams with other disabilities? Like would you play a wheelchair team, for example, or? No, we can't play a wheelchair team because that will be a... If it's basketball, yeah, but football you need to kick, so wheelchair, no. But we'll be playing on the cerebral palsy football team. Okay. But that's in the main tournament. Otherwise, in the friendly games, we play normal boys. We even play the female football team. We have practice with them. So that's all in the practice and friendly matches. But in the tournament and cups, we are competing in the Cerebral Palsy Football League. That It's so wonderful to me that opportunity, opportunities exist for athletes um, beyond disabilities, right? That, that, that you can see and that others can see um, what's possible for you physically. Because I think a lot of times, you know, society um, and people who are ill-informed or misinformed will put limitations or say, how would that be possible? 
Um, and so I would imagine that a lot of your work as a Paralympian, then you said that, you know, you sort of became a speaker and a Paralympian at the same time. I would imagine a lot of your work as a Paralympian is educating the public on what's possible <coughs> for people with cerebral palsy and what the mission of the Paralympics is. Is that correct? So the journey of the Paralympic football team, obviously I'm no more part of the team. That was one part of my life. But the bigger mission was to bring awareness that do not judge people with disability. They should be given equal opportunity, equal rights. And Emmy, I got to tell you some of my friends in the Paralympic football team. Oh man, they play even better than my normal friends. <laughs> so if they were not given this opportunity, they wouldn't have showcased the talent. Yeah, that's like, a great point. Because it's it's not that it's their um it's not a, a, a talent on top of a disability, right? It's a talent. Yep, it's the talent. Alongside so, a disability, which is a little bit different. So I think the talent is more important. The problem with the world right now is we are too judgmental. We see what's on the front end, but I think we can't do that because I'm sure everyone has a bank story. And speaking of backstories, you have a book entitled Better Than Normal. Can you tell us what inspired that book and, and what you hope to do with it? So let me tell you what inspired me <coughs> to write Better Than Normal. When I was 12 years old, I would get bullied at school. And one day I came home to my dad. I shouted, Dad, why am I not? normal and how can I be normal because I was frustrated I was getting bullied so my dad was shocked he didn't know how to react to a 12 year old kid he said look son maybe in your life you'll never be normal this is the reality there's no cure for cerebral palsy so you may never be normal right? But if you promise me to work hard and never give up in life, he said, I promise you, forget normal. One day you will be better than normal. Oh, I love that. Oh, your dad seems like a, seems like an amazing person. Oh, he's awesome. He is the ranks to riches story. He's another keynote itself. <laughs> but after 10 years, I wrote the book called Better Than Normal. That is wonderful. And you've sold copies of that book worldwide and you speak around the globe as well, correct? Correct. And so what kind of organizations do you find yourself, like if you could pick the perfect audience for, for Better Than Normal? What would that audience look like? Who's in the audience? Who's bringing you in? What's that stage look like for you? So I'll break it down because I've done more than 200 keynotes around the world, right? So the, this are my three main topics. Number one, I do on self-leadership. That's for all the big CEOs and director and, you know, HR people because I believe in life, before you become a leader, you need to be a good self-leader. If you can't take care of yourself, how are you going to take care of your team and organization? So this is normally for the C-suit leaders. The second topic which I do is sales motivation. So I do sales motivation more for like the insurance company, the banks, the pharma companies. Why? Because all these industries, they need a lot of sales. They got a lot of agents. And when they go out daily, they get rejected every time. So they lose hope. 
And that's where I come in. I talk about overcoming failure, overcoming adversity, how to strive beyond your comfort zone so they can relate to that, right? And the third topic I do, my favorite topic, which I get invited a lot from, from companies like Tata, Microsoft, Accenture is diversity and inclusion because all these big organizations, they want to build a diverse and inclusive culture. So more people are given an equal opportunity to rise and become better than normal. <laughs> That is fantastic. And so when you talk about diversity and inclusion, um, are you speaking, you know, so the show, the audience for the show is black and brown professionals, right? In corporate America. Um, And then there's this intersection of, you know, so for you, you're, you would be considered brown in the US, right? Um, Uh, So then you've got this international component, which adds a whole lot of complexity to the diversity and inclusion conversation. Um, but I would imagine that um, people with disabilities probably face, um, you know, if you had to, if you had to like separate out all the buckets, right, that you belong to, I would think that disability would be probably one of the primary uh, places where people are excluded from the workforce for just a variety of reasons. Um, and so, you know, then the word intersectionality comes in, right, because you're all of these things at once. What advice do you have for people who are in the workforce right now who maybe look around and say, you know what, we don't see anybody like Hitesh in our workforce. We don't have folks here. We have not made space for folks, um, you know, with disabilities or we've not made space for folks um, with this international lens. What advice do you have for them on, on how to create that seat at their table? So I got two scenarios. Scenario number one, if there are less people with disability, because your city or country has less people with disability, then it's a very good thing, (laughs) because we don't want more people to be sick and disabled, right? Health comes first. But if you're in a city where there are people with disability and they are not given an equal opportunity, then I feel you should make space for them. Because the big organization don't give them that opportunity, then who will, right? And everyone looks up to organization. So if they do it, other people will respect those guys. And the point is, I worked with many disabled people. Sometimes I get shocked because they are smarter and talented than me and many other people out there. It's just they are not given the platform to showcase their hidden talent. So when a guy with a disability comes for an interview, number one, Treat him like everyone else. Don't sympathize with him because I'm sure he doesn't want to be sympathized. Now, I can't speak for everyone with a disability, but what you can do is empathize. Empathize better. And don't see the thoughts in him. See if he's qualified for the job, see if he's a good fit. If yes, then give him that opportunity. He may do a better job. And in fact, if he's in, he or she, if they are in the organization and they do a good job, these guys are not going to be a liability. They will be an asset because other employees will become motivated and inspired. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think this goes back to the, the idea of the Paralympics, right? It's not people who are um, talented on top of a disability, right? They're talented alongside having disability. And if we can, if we can harness that talent, that disability becomes irrelevant because it's not the person's body that makes them disabled, right? It's all of the things that society puts in their way. Yeah, I mean, you look 
Who, do you know who's the greatest mind in the world? Right now? No, in the entire world, who has been the one of the greatest mind? My mind goes to Stephen Hawking immediately. All right. And <laughs> he couldn't even move a finger, but he was controlling the entire universe just by using the power of the mind. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of times we overlook, right? We, we can't see past these superficial things. And so we overlook the genius um, that's, that someone has within them or that someone's able to offer um, because of our own limited, um, limited perspectives or limited point of view. And so um, another way I want to ask this question, Hitesh, is, you know, there are probably some folks listening right now who have been told um, in their lives that they can't do what they want to do, that they don't have the ability, that they are limited because of the color of their skin, because of their upbringing, because of their, um, you know, the limitations of their bodies or the limitations of their minds or the limitations of their family circumstances. What do you say to them um, about what's possible for them? So I got one message. You can be black, white, Indian, Chinese, girl, man, women, lesbian, gay, disabled, normal, doesn't matter. Everyone in this entire universe will face problem regardless if you're rich or poor. Everyone has different problems. Nobody is perfect. But when you face that problem or the obstacle, you have two options. Number one, you can give up. <laughs> Number two, you can get up. Whatever option you choose will create your upcoming destiny. The problem with many people is they choose to give up because that's easy, but it's bad for the long run. <laughs> yeah, we only get one shot at this. And if we don't take our shot, um, it's not going to be there waiting for us, right? Yep, totally. So always get up. Because the more you get up, the more opportunities you're going to get. But if you give up and cry, you're only going to be focused on the problem and not the opportunities. So I, that brings me to my next question, because this is not it for you, right? So you are not only... Um, an Olympic athlete, Paralympic athlete, and not only a world-class speaker, and not only a, an internationally uh, acclaimed author, you're also an entrepreneur and you're starting a new business soon, correct? Yep. So this, this wasn't my idea. It was my dad's idea because majority of my better than normal work I do is in India. And you know, India is 1.3 billion people. It's a huge country. And he saw my movement growing there. I started to get invited for different, even Bollywood events and all that. So my dad said, look, you have transformed your life. What if we can help more people like you? Wouldn't that be great? And he's a businessman. His dream is to live a legacy before he passes on. So he says, I got a good idea. I'm going to retire anyways. So let's do one thing. Since we have transformed your life using the right therapy and all that, I'm going to help you build a better than normal clinic in India. So me and my dad are building a better than normal clinic in India. It's a four-story building. The first floor is physiotherapy. The second floor is hydrotherapy, hydro pool. And the city I'm building in, they don't have all that hydro and aqua therapy. The third floor is speech therapy, dental, and all that. And the fourth floor will be gas room. 
you know for people coming from abroad or other cities. That is fantastic. So you've got physical therapy on the first floor, hydrotherapy on the second floor, speech therapy on the third floor, and then there's a, a live-in component to this as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's amazing. And you told me before we started recording why you picked India for this uh, for this endeavor. Because see, uh, Singapore, five million people. So whenever I'm in Singapore, I tell people. I want to inspire 50 million people. They give me that crazy look, like what's he talking about? We only have 5 million people. What is he going to inspire us 10 times? When I <laughs> went to my, <laughs> when I went to India, my second home, I told them, I want to inspire 50 million people. They gave me a crazier look. Is it what's wrong with you? Why 50 million? Why not 500 million? <laughs> that is so, great. It's all a matter of scale, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I didn't change my goal, but I changed the location. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So you can inspire every person in Singapore and you'd only be at 10% of your goal. Yeah. Or you could and just, you know, stand on a street in India and <laughs> the people walking by and you'd be done in, in a couple months, right? <laughs> the other thing is Singapore, it's already good. There's a lot of, there's not much adversity, right? So for the work I'm doing, India is a better place. Because there's a lot of different adversity there. There's a lot of poverty there. So when you go there, you can make a big impact by your story. Many people even are betting that there'll be a Bollywood movie under my name. <laughs> they are already That would be wonderful. In the next 10 years. <laughs> so who will you pick to play you in the Bollywood movie of your life? That's a good question. So uh, we will have to see. <laughs> okay, I you're might, keeping tight-lipped on that one. I understand. <laughs> I, I might I might play my own character. <laughs> Ooh, that would be great. Because <laughs> if you go to my YouTube, I do a lot of short movies and I direct and I act in them. So you can go check out my YouTube channel. I create short movies like three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes with a powerful message. Oh, so fantastic. Well, of, put the link in the show notes. Thank you for that. Yeah. One of my passion as a kid was to be an actor. So, but obviously with a disability, it would be a hundred times harder. And when you go to India, everyone wants to be an actor. So I'm like, you know what? I'll just use my story and try to find a way there. <laughs> if I oh, don't, I'll do it. If I don't, I'll do it myself. <laughs> I love it. So, so not only will you create the role that you will play, but you will create the role that only you can play. So, see, that's another thing. I don't know what the future unfolds because I do create short story movies and one of my crazy goals is to even create my own web series where I can have it on platform like Netflix and Amazon, but that's the next stage because I'm already working on too many things. <laughs> I say, no shortage of ideas here for you. You are, you are incredible with all of the talents and all of the ambitions that you have, um, not just for yourself, but for the world. So if there's one short movie you should watch on my YouTube, my YouTube is Hitesh or go watch this short movie. It was directed by me, Rich versus Poor. I think the people in the US will love it. 
Excellent. We'll make sure to link to it. Yeah, that's that's a crazy video. It went viral. <laughs> Excellent. So rich versus poor on uh, Hitesh R's YouTube channel. Be sure to check that out. Hitesh, where is your book available in the U.S.? Is it on Amazon or do we need to order it from a bookstore? So initially it was online. It was on bookstores. But then I realized so my books uh, sales online were not doing so well. But whenever I did a keynote, let's say a keynote to 500 people, I bring 300 books. All of it would sell out because I understood that when people see me, they hear the story they buy. So instead of focusing online, I started doing offline. So sorry to your audience, they can't get my book online, but you can get all my content of the book and the work I do on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Look for better than normal. Excellent. And the other way to get your book, I guess, would be to bring you in to speak at our companies. And yep. buy your book, buy a signed oh. copy in the back of the room as soon as the talk's over, right? So that's the best thing. I've done, unfortunately, I've done only two keynotes in the U.S. And the crowd went bizarre. They went mad. They have never seen such a keynote. So one of my dreams is to do more keynotes in the U.S., but I have also heard that America is a very competitive market when it comes to speaking. It's like acting in India. <laughs> yeah, as a professional speaker here, I have to say that that's true. But I think there's room for everybody. I think there's a stage for everyone here. And hopefully when COVID restrictions lift and the world goes back to some semblance of normal or better than normal, Hitesh, we'll see you here on a stage. And I, if, if you make it to the U.S., please let me know um, because I would, I would travel to see you and to, um, to be in the I, audience. I had one keynote this year. I think it was at um, Boston, somewhere in Boston, but we had to call it off because of the COVID-19 situation. In fact, this was the best year because I had inquiries from UK, Qatar, Malaysia, and they all got canceled. Yeah, well, we, we will get them back. It, it will all come back, I am sure of hopefully, it. Hopefully, hopefully. I am sure of it, <laughs> bigger in 2021. So Hitesh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your message. And thank you for just putting so much of yourself into the world. And Emmy, more than that, thank you for having me to, to the show. And thank you for the work you're doing. I've seen your podcast. I've seen a bit of your work and it's incredible. I think we need more people like you. Oh, thank you. Well, I hope to. I hope that we can collaborate on something in the future. I would love to. Um, I would love to come to India again and and uh, visit you and see some of my friends there. And you know, maybe we can maybe we can do a global tour together. So I already have one opportunity for you, which I'll discuss after the podcast. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, with that, because I want to hear all about this opportunity. And uh, I know that our listeners are, are ready to, to move to the next episode. But Hitesh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you again. And um, see it to be an audience. Make sure you're checking out Hitesh on social media. Uh, and hopefully he'll be in your area soon. Thanks, guys. So what do you think, Zach? Well, I mean, honestly, I just I was pretty humbled. And it was a it was a sobering con it was sobering in that, you know, he he didn't have everything handed to him and yet he was able to to create and build as he was. It was inspiring to me, quite frankly. And I'm excited that folks like that exist in this world. And the journey was really inspiring to me. I felt a lot of things resonate. 
um, from a perspective that, you know, it's about being resourceful and, and and also leaning on people and not necessarily kind of like being your own little silo. Right. Like, how do you build community and make sure that you're you have the humility to reach out and ask for help or let people know what you got going on and be willing to, like, share your dreams, like which is rare. You know, like it's it's rare to meet people who are willing to just like to push and go uh, and let folks know exactly what what they're looking to do and how they look and what they're looking to accomplish. We kind of hide those things until they're big enough for us to share and it never gets there and then they, they kind of die. And so the fact that um, it's just a, the journey, I just I found it incredible. How about you? Yeah, I what I love is that Hitesh has this huge goal, this huge goal, right? A, a metric. I want to inspire, you know, 500 million people or 500,000 people, you know, with this message and, and literally said, so I need to move so I can do that. I need to go where there are more people. And that's the, that's the goal, right? And just putting it out there. And I, I think when we have these, you know, these huge uh, ambitions, these lofty ambitions, sometimes they may scare us and we don't share them. And sometimes we're afraid to even admit to ourselves, like, this is the impact I want to have on the world. This is the influence I want to have. This is who I want to inspire. And I learned so much, you know, in that conversation about put it out there, make it big. If people say it's not big enough, go somewhere where people ask, is that all you want to do? Because that's what he's doing, right? He's, (laughs) there aren't enough people here. I will go to India. I will go where there are more people and I will inspire more people. And I just think that's amazing to have that kind of clarity and that kind of vision and that kind of will to make it happen. Same. Yeah. Like I said, it's just inspiring. I found it incredible. Now, Amy, before we go, why don't we talk about like where folks can find us and all that kind of stuff? Oh, sure. So, you know, you found this podcast somewhere, right? If you're listening, you found it somewhere. And the best way to help other people find it is to go right back where it was, right where you picked it up and give us that six star review. Now, Zach, you and I know there aren't six stars. There are five. What's the sixth star? The sixth star is a written review of the show. That's right. Because when you write a review, it helps the platform know that you're a real person, not a bot, not some, you know, click farm somewhere and that you really engaged and that this really meant something to you. So if this story meant something to you, if this series means something to you, please give us that sixth star by writing that review and sharing this on social media, share it with your friends, talk about it, you know, in your zoom calls, you need something to talk about, talk about uh, living corporate and see it to be it. And, you know, get people engaged in this because we really are, you know, I feel like such a small part of this, but you know, this is a movement. This is a moment where we can really make a difference in whose stories get told and how they get told and who gets to tell them. Absolutely. Uh, look, I mean, I just want to thank you again. Uh, shout out to the see it to be a series and shout out to y'all first and last time listeners, you know, black and brown people everywhere, aspiring allies. You know what I mean? All of y'all. We love y'all till next time. You've been listening to live in corporate. Catch y'all soon. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.